Um, so next, we have uh, one of our first uh, expert speakers uh, who is focusing on uh, are we experiencing a new normal with extreme weather? Before I get there, I want to mention that last year in 2018, the city of Orlando uh, finalized and published a climate vulnerability assessment. It was led by uh, Dr. Brittany Sellers in my office and uh, really outlined the types of weather and climate-related stressors uh, that are currently and will continue to, or even new ones, uh, um, to be impacting us into the future. Through this research, we found a couple of different things I want to mention. We found that Orlando's temperature uh, is on track to rise four degrees Fahrenheit overall by the year of 2050, meaning our summers are warmer, our winters are warmer, and what's interesting is most of the warming actually isn't during the day, it's the evening warning, warming temperatures, which is actually really impacting habitats and wildlife and many other things, including heating and cooling. So most of the times we're thinking about this warming being in the middle of the day, it's actually the evening temperature warmings that are seeing the greatest rise. Um, in addition, we um, saw that there's more intensive rainfall events and inland flooding and has a high probability of occurring uh, on a more regular basis. Even afternoon storms, if you have witnessed this, and I've been here for 15 years in Orlando, I've witnessed the amount of water that's falling on a regular afternoon storm to be much more than it was just a decade ago, let alone massive Category 5 hurricanes that continue to threaten us, especially over the last three years. These are things that we are concerned about, and the first step is understanding that vulnerability so that we, we can begin to address it head on. With that, we have good news. Our next speaker is Dr. J. Marshall Shepard, a leading international expert in weather and climate and is the, and, and is the Georgia Athletic Association Dist Distinguished Press Professor of Geography and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Georgia. That was a mouthful. <laughs> Dr. Shepard was uh, the 2013 president of American Meteorological Society, AMS, the nation's largest and oldest professional science society in the atmospheric and related sciences. Dr. Shepard serves as the director of the University of Georgia's Atmospheric Sciences Program and full professor in the Department of Geography, where he is the assistant de uh, department head. Dr. Shepard is also the host of the Weather Channel's award-winning Sunday talk show and podcast, Weather Geeks, and a contributor to Forbes magazine. Please help me in welcoming Dr. J. Marshall Shepard to the stage. Thank you very much for that introduction. It's an honor to be here, and thank you for what you're doing with your foundation. It's so important. I often talk about my kids as well, because as a scientist, I encounter climate skeptics. And one of the things that I encounter, in fact, I've been swatting some down on Twitter today, and uh, one of the things that I often uh, say to them is, look, you know, I'm happy to be wrong about all of the data that I'm experiencing. I'm happy to be absolutely wrong in 30 years, because if I'm right, my kids lose. So there's no stake in me being correct. And so this is not a competition. This is not a game. It's our lives. So I've actually been tasked with giving you the grim news uh, because I think this conference is primarily about solutions. So my, my discussions today really won't talk much about solutions. I, I, I really am going to talk about the new normals that we're experiencing with weather because weather is one of those places where we can bring climate change to people in their lives today. Often there is a perception this is about polar bears and about the year 2080 and it's about kitchen table issues today and weather is one that really impacts that. I, I did want to mention a couple of solutions-oriented things that are going on, and I, I just glanced down and noticed John Lanier in the room uh, the, uh, with the uh, Ray C. Anderson Foundation. Um, there are a couple of things that are going on in the state of Georgia that I would invite you to Google and take a closer look at. One is called the Georgia Climate Project, which is a solutions-oriented effort to bring climate change into the policy, business, and sort of regular people space, if you will, rather than in the ivory tower. Uh, the other initiative is Georgia Drawdown, which is building on the excellent drawdown book and project, if you're not familiar with that, and we're looking to uh, apply that principle to the state of Georgia. So this is, these are both solutions-driven efforts funded by the Ray C. Anderson Foundation, and both efforts are, uh, are available on the website, so I encourage you to Google them. Second sort of order of business before I get started, make sure you're telling people what's going on today. I believe the hashtag is Climate Correction 2019, is that correct? So what we're doing in this room is useless if we're not 
sharing it if we're just keeping it in this room. We're talking, preaching to the choir. So make sure you're tweeting out there and using that hashtag. And thirdly, feel free to follow me if you choose, at Dr. Shepherd 2013 I keep it popping on Twitter, so to speak, So, on, especially as it relates to Twitter. So be sure to uh, check, check those out, uh, Dr. Shepherd. So let's get into this. Are we experiencing a new normal as it relates to climate? I don't, I don't know where my slides are. Does, does someone need to initialize those? I don't know. We'll get those started. So while we do that, and I think I've actually just maybe messed up the slides here, but while we do that, let me say something about what I was just doing in Washington, D.C. last week on this topic. I, I was one of the experts invited to speak to the United States House of Representatives Science Committee. They were holding a hearing on extreme weather and climate change. And so what we were talking about with the House Science Committee is are we experiencing an era of extreme weather and what should we be doing about it from a legislative standpoint? Are, are we good to go or? Well, I can just talk. So what we talked about in that, I, I wanna just give you some of my experience while we kind of get this ready. I've briefed Congress before and it was on a similar topic. And one of the things that we found at that time in 2013 is there was a little more skepticism among the, the body about whether extreme weather is linked to climate change. In 2016, I was a co-author on a uh, report by the National Academy of Sciences looking at something we in science call attribution. Can we link today's weather events to climate change? This is a new branch of climate science called attribution. And one of the things that we know is that we now can. There's a varying degree of understanding. We know that heat waves, for example, have a very strong attribution signal to climate change. As you just heard, extreme weather events, the top one to two percent weather events in terms of rainfall are clearly linked to climate change in terms of the intensity. Uh, and in fact, what I was just doing before I I came up here today, uh, there was a 103 degree temperature reading in Birmingham, Alabama uh, just the other day. Birmingham, Alabama, October. Now, the real issue is the National Weather Service in Birmingham issued a statement saying that reading may be flawed. It may not actually be real, so don't, don't get too carried away about it. And this morning on social media, the climate contrarian crowd is just eating that up. Now, see, we told you it wasn't 103. I said, yeah, but it was 101. The point is, let's not get into the minutiae over 103. Clearly, there's extreme record-breaking temperatures in the southeast, and it is coupled to climate change. And so what we have to do as scientists is find ways, and that's why I appreciate the efforts of uh, uh, philanthropic organizations, find ways to couple the information to what's happening in the real world, to what I call the kitchen table issues that people face in their lives every day. Uh, I have no idea whether we're going to go, so I could stand here and talk to you. Um, this, this made, I, I actually had a very nice presentation planned for you, but <laughs> what I will do is just try to summarize that, and I've been here before in terms of uh, these types of things. Climate change and extreme events are what people notice and feel. We don't feel averages. How many of you have actually even heard people say, so what if we warm one degree or two degree? I mean, that's great. I mean, there are some positive aspects of that. The reality is the Earth system feels one degrees, two degrees, four degrees, in the same way that our bodies feel a one, two, or three degree fever. We would not want our children to run a sustained fever of three degrees because the body the physical system starts to feel that, even if we, in a terms of a sensible perception, don't feel one degree. But the extremes, an extreme heat wave, extreme flooding, a Hurricane Michael. Oh, by the way, did you notice there was a hurricane in the Azores this week? That's weird. And let me tell you why it's weird. Hurricanes, one, normally move toward the west, but in the last two years, we've had two hurricanes threaten Ireland. Lorenzo, this week, even today as we speak, there are red warnings in Ireland. That's sort of their highest weather warning that they issue. Oh, looks like we're up to date. I could keep going on though, I don't even need those. But let's do it, let's do it. So that's Hurricane Lorenzo right on cue, uh, satellite image that I I took yesterday, a couple of days ago, and included. That hurricane is too strong for where it's located. It is the strongest hurricane that far east and north on record in the Atlantic Ocean. It was a Category 5. 
And there are studies in the peer-reviewed literature that suggest Europe will face more hurricanes in the future because the waters in the Atlantic are warming. This is not the greatest of figures, but what I'm showing you, those little dots on the left are all of the Category 5 hurricanes that we've experienced in the Atlantic on record. All of them. Notice that little blue dot. Now, how many of you, I, I know there's some of age here, my age, how many of you remember the uh, one of these things is not like the other on Sesame Street? <laughs> that's what comes to mind when I look at that. Because that's that's not where we find Category 5 hurricanes. I shouldn't be looking at a hurricane cone over Ireland, but that's exactly what you see. So I mentioned that I was in, in Washington, D.C. just last week briefing the House Science Committee, and that's a picture taken by our University of Georgia Public Affairs folks. And I said the extremes are becoming more extreme, and people feel them more than averages. And that's why this is an important topic. Uh, I don't know if this is going to go, so I'll go past that. So let me deal with the elephants in the room for a moment. And the main elephant in the room that I deal with as a climate scientist is someone, I'll be hanging out at Subway eating a sandwich or just wandering through the mall. Someone finds out I'm a climate scientist and says, well, Dr. Shepard, the climate changes naturally. We've always had hurricanes. How many of you have heard that by show of hands? Of course you have. We've always had hurricanes. It always changes naturally. And I said, yes, that's true. Grass grows naturally also, but when we put fertilizer on the soil, it grows differently, right? Trees fall naturally in the forest, but that doesn't make chainsaws a hoax. <laughs> so we have to get beyond this notion, there's the natural cycles, I, I mean, I, I've got a PhD in atmospheric science, so I know the climate changes naturally, thank you for telling me. But we have to get beyond this notion that it's either or, it's and. Of course our naturally varying climate system is in place, but there is a human steroid on top of it. Just this morning at the hotel, I was explaining to someone, because if you're looking at the records that are being broken, heat records in the southeast just this week, Athens, Georgia, where the University of Georgia is, the record temperature for today, this date, is 91 degrees. But today in Athens, it may be 99 degrees. We're not going to just break the record. We're going to shatter it by eight degrees. My colleague, Dr. John Knox at UGA says, if a, an Olympic sprinter broke a sprinting record by nine seconds, they would think he or she was using performance enhancing drugs. Our climate system is on steroids. And so that has led to a new normal. Now you see the warming of our planet over the last hundred or so years, and you can clearly see more red in the last several decades. I think the point there by our previous uh, colleagues is very important. The intensity of the, and, and rapid change or rate of change of the warming is what really concerns us as scientists. And that actually leads to something that's very counterintuitive. I'm about to maybe blow some of your minds here. I know it blows some of the climate contrarian minds when I say this. Extreme weather events feel the changes that are happening in the Arctic. What I mean by that is as the Arctic warms, we, and, and I know there's some scientists in the room, as the Arctic warms, we now are decreasing or relaxing the difference in temperature between the tropics and the poles. That's what we call in science a gradient. Got a little, I'm a professor, so we gotta have a little science lesson here. So if we are relaxing that difference in temperature, the jet stream pattern, the jet stream is, is the strength of the jet stream, which is very important in weather, is determined by how strong that temperature difference is, that gradient. So as that temperature difference is relaxing, our jet stream patterns are becoming more wavy. And guess what that does? As you see in this graphic, it leads to more extreme events on the warm side and cold side. So I can make an argument that that extreme blizzard out in Montana last week was because of that trough, that dipping feature in the jet stream. So the extremes are becoming more extreme in the amplitude of these jet stream patterns. So there's a look at the cold out there in Montana and the north, northwestern US. Now take a look at that graphic, because this is something else we deal with as climate scientists. If you look at that graphic from a couple of days ago, you see a lot more red than blue, don't you? But yet a climate contrarian was like, oh yeah, it's, uh, we had a snowstorm and it's cold in Seattle. I said, it's not Seattle warming, it's global 
warming. <laughs> but people will tend to anchor their perspectives on climate to what's happening in their backyards, right? So we have to shatter that narrative. So consistent with what we just heard about Florida, some projections by Climate Central suggest that Savannah is actually trending toward a climate system that's more like South Texas over the next 30 years. We will expect more dangerous days in terms of heat index, which impacts uh, outdoor worker hours, all types of health issues of vulnerable populations, et cetera. Uh, here you see the changes in temperature in the southeast, including Florida. Interestingly enough, the southeast over the last 50 years has actually warmed at a slower rate than the rest of the United States, but it's starting to catch up quite rapidly. There, there was a well-known warming hole in the southeast that may be due to um, pollution and reforestation over the last 30 or 40 years. As you also heard, there's a very significant and detectable signature of climate warming in rainfall events. This is a press release from NOAA, uh, big flooding in uh, Louisiana a couple of years ago. A study showed that it was 40% more likely because of climate change, 40%. And that's just some data showing that in every part of this country, uh, the intensity of rainstorms have increased over the last 50 years. So the rainstorms of 2019 are very different than the rainstorms of, 20, of 1970. The problem with that is like, Many cities, city of Orlando, Atlanta, Athens, Georgia, have stormwater management systems and engineering designed for the 1970s rainstorms. And so that's why we see more flooding in cities. We see more drought, more frequent and intense drought in the state of Georgia in 2007. I live in uh, metro Atlanta. Uh, in 2007, it w I wasn't sure if I was going to have drinking water uh, because one of the main reservoirs that we use in the city of Atlanta, by some accounts at least, were 30 to 60 days from being empty because of drought. State of Georgia Climate Office posting the uh, number of intense hurricanes, and you heard this mentioned earlier. Uh, with hurricanes, we expect we may not necessarily see an increase in frequency of hurricanes and tropical cyclones and typhoons, but when we see a hurricane over the next 50 years, it's likely to be stronger. And there's flooding in Hurricane Harvey in Houston. This is the report that I think I mentioned. This was a report issued in 2016. I was one of the 12 expert scientists called by the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, D.C. to produce a report. What do we know scientifically about what we can say about extreme weather events and climate change? So this, I believe, to this date, is still the definitive report on extreme weather and climate change. I invite you to read all 176 pages of it if you can slog through it. But if you want an abridged version, I did write a Forbes article uh, called Death to the Most Abused Question in Climate Change. So just Google that, my name, and you'll find it. And I summarize the report. And the most abused question is, was that caused by climate change? We have to get that question out of the dialogue. And I know you're saying, what are you talking about? because that's an ill-posed question, and that's one of the things we found in the study. I, can say, I can't say with uh, definitive certainty that a home run hitter's 800th or 600th home run was caused by steroid use. I can't say that, because he probably could hit home run naturally. But I can certainly look at his statistics and see that his home run numbers in terms of length and number have increased because of steroid. So a better framing is, are events like that more likely, or are they more intense? because of climate change. Climate change extremes affect people. Uh, there are natural and human signatures in all extreme weather events. So um, at this point, I like to use very simple analogies. It's, it's just part of my approach. I mean, I can talk all the talk and equations that scientists talk, but my wife looks at me with this blank stare when I do that. So I know she likes cookies, so I was trying to explain, don't tell her I said that, please. I know, I know that people get cookies. So let me explain attribution using these cookies. Every one of those cookies was made with a slightly different mix of ingredients. So the cookie comes up slightly differently, right? And that's how our weather systems are. Yes, there's natural variability in the system, but if I fundamentally change the amount of flour in the recipe, the cookie's gonna always be different. We're changing the flour in the climate recipe, if that makes sense. 
So this is an example of a study done by colleagues up in New York on Hurricane Florence from 2018. Florence stalled over the Carolinas, dumping tons of rainfall in that region, causing tremendous flooding. And this study, it's a rapid attribution study, found that Florence was much more likely to be that intense in a climate-changed world as opposed to a world 40 years ago. So we have the evidence. This is showing you, again, this is one of these figures that we use in the, in the, in the report. Basically what it's showing you, the higher the little circle is on that line, that's where we are in terms of the scientific literature's confidence that climate change is affecting those events. So heat, lack of cold events, rainfall and drought near the top. Hurricanes are in the middle. That's not because we don't think hurricanes are being affected by climate change. It's just that many of our climate models don't reproduce hurricanes very well, and we have a very truncated data record. So that's why we couldn't put it higher on the list. We don't have any evidence right now that tornadic storms are linked to climate change. That doesn't mean they aren't, but it means where the science is right now, we can't say that conclusively. So these are the reasons why we do attribution studies. We want to understand, increase the understanding of how they've changed over time, and we want to inform choices about assessing and managing risks for adaptation strategies, and that's relevant to the discussion here today. You're talking about solutions. Solutions, Georgia Drawdown is focused more on the mitigation side of the solution space, reducing carbon emissions, but there is a significant solution space that involves adaptation as well. And there's also another one lingering, lingering out there too called climate intervention or geoengineering. Now, the studies on geoengineering are not conclusive. In fact, I, I mentioned this before at another conference. There's a, a 80s band that I love called the Pet Shop Boys, and they have a song called Sometimes the Solution is Worse Than the Problem. So we don't know the impact of their system on some of the geoengineering strategies, but we have to keep them on the table. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we have to ask the right questions. We've got to get rid of the, is it caused by climate change question. So this is Hurricane Michael. Hurricane Michael devastated the panhandle of Florida. I attended Florida State University, so I'm very familiar with that part of, of the state. But it also did something interesting in my state. It came into the state of Georgia still is almost a category three hurricane. That's unprecedented. And it destroyed much of our agriculture in that part of our state in terms of cotton, peanuts, pecans, timber, vegetables. And so I'll close with this, because while we talk about in the academic community the extreme events and the likely increases to climate because of climate change, People need to connect the dots because they buy peanut butter. They buy t-shirts. And those changes affect their kitchen table issues. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a, a rest of a conference. And thank you for indulging me while we had those little technical issues. Thank you. Excellent. So now we're, now we're climate experts. We've, we've got some background information, uh, and, and now we transition ourselves really to start talking about solutions. You know, in, you know, being in government the last five and a half years, I've realized that this is a game of, of balance, trying to find balance between too much government and not enough government. Uh, in terms of how we regulate, in terms of the types of policies that we need to implement in order to address this serious crisis. In, in Orlando, we've really focused on policy, and um, we've, we've implemented a couple of things that are very unordinary in, in the state of Florida and in the southeast. Um, what we've realized is that energy efficiency happens to be one of the greatest uh, ways to address this crisis. Happens to be the most cost effective and most impactful way to reduce emissions from our power plants. And so one of the foundational policies that cities around the country, including Atlanta and many others, have implemented is what's called building benchmarking energy audits and transparency. The notion around enabling information about our buildings and our homes so that we can make better informed decisions about where we want to live and work. When you go to rent an apartment, you seldom get a utility bill or a group of utility bills to see how much you're going to spend in utilities. You're usually just sold on the rent. 
Uh, and in Orlando, we have passed a policy that requires that transparency and has created this cycle of improvement. If you go to our website, we actually have a published map of all of this data, the greenhouse gas inventory for each individual building above 50,000 square feet in Orlando. And what we've identified in cities that have implemented this far beyond, uh, before us is that it is the foundational policy step to start creating a cycle of improvement, creating jobs, driving economic development, reducing pollution, and creating a clean tech economy.